transport Journey to my dead sea Stairs just to fix my A quiet abrasion With our voices in unison Against the imposition We stand, we demand It's our solemn mission Welcome to the Wake Up America show. I'm your host, Austin Peterson. Glad and thankful to have you here, especially all you early birds who like to get up early and join us live on the show. Can you just let's give you a, a pat on the back? You guys are the real OGs. Nice to see you. Bruce Burt Whistle, what's up? Quest Fanning, my smoking hot wifey. Steffi's in there. David Lee, Blue Trike. Hi, Joni. You look kind of cute. What's up, Matt Unruh? How are you doing today? T Mill 22, Bitch Mobile, the one and only. We love ya. Kermode Bear, what's up? What's happening? KB Andy. Hey, Andy. Mr. Vanderhout. Nice to see you here. Everybody ready to rock? Barney Styles, we ready to go? Let's go, let's go, let's go. A lot to talk about, a lot to offend the gentler sex today. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we'll talk about that in just a moment. Let's get this all set up, though. Katie Couric is going viral this morning for an interview she did with Bill Maher, where she says that Donald Trump supporters are anti-intellectualism. I've got a lot to say about that. I'm going to talk about it this morning. As a British person, do the entire show with a British accent, I don't know why. I'm Russell Brand, yo. We're on Rumble. So it's all about peace and love, yo. 
Stephanie, I watched that movie uh, Forgetting Sarah Marshall or something recently, which, you know, it's a dirty, filthy movie. Not for children, but it's a funny movie if you haven't seen it yet. A little too long. They go on a little too long with a lot of, like, the weird, like, Dracula musical thing. It's too much, but otherwise it's a pretty funny show. Don't forget to click that like button. And if it's your first time here today, follow the channel. Follow the, no, no, we'll do a German accent today. You want to follow the channel and watch the Wake Up America show. Austin was always a German. He was secretly a German. What's up, Erz Mommy? She says, so you're going to offend soy boys? Yes. <laughs> and soy girls. Soy boys and soy girls. Will Run Riot gets a day off today. Oh, that must be nice. Uh, Matt Unruh did not like the movie. Uh, what's up, drummer Goy? Nice to see you. Uh, look, it's Liz. Says that is a good Russell Brand. Thank you very much. I do like doing watch some Russell Brand every once in a while here on Rumble. It's lovely. Now I'm doing like Ringo Starr, one of the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking about on the show today? I got a bunch of blank spaces in the show. Sometimes I feel like I've got so much to talk about. I don't need guests. I don't need articles and stories although i do have some uh i just need to riff and let's hang out together we don't need to sit around and you know like block 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 segment 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 there's nobody here i don't have a crew i don't have a producer i don't have an editor i don't have a writer there's no there's no boss to fire me if i say something offensive i can say whatever the hell i want <laughs> talk about whatever the hell i want uh, yeah, I've got some stories in here we're going to talk about, but I don't feel like the need today to necessarily s stick to the rundown real hardcore. I am going to play some clips. We are going to play the Katie Couric uh, Talks to Bill Maher interview, but I actually was more compelled by a segment that Bill Maher did last Friday night, I think, where he was talking about, or uh, Saturday, I don't know, I don't, I don't watch the show live, where he was talking about how bad Canada has gotten in terms of their overall quality of life, their health care, their unemployment rates. And I thought it was a really interesting segment where he talked about why people still like to try and point to Canada as an example of where the United States should be. But Canada is falling behind the United States. I think our friend Bruce Burtwistle is really going to enjoy the show today. Some people how might be offended, you? but I know Bruce Burtwistle is going to enjoy it. We're going to talk about his native land of Canada. Canada, oh, Canada. You're a lifetime of mystery on this planet, uh, uh, Canada, oh Canada, you got Justin Trudeau, make you want to leave this planet. Uh. Uh, so yeah, we will talk about that. I'll play that clip. The Mother Jones, which is a, I'm just going to say it, it is a shit left hard magazine uh, hosted by one of the most hardcore, insane, bat guano, crazy leftists. David Korn wrote a hit piece on the Libertarian Party, a very long, extensive hit hit piece on the Libertarian Party called The Spectacular Implosion of the Libertarian Party. So we're going to talk about that this morning, and we're going to uh, analyze it and see separate the uh, wheat from the chaff, the truth from the lies, from the leftist lies. Some of it's legit, and it is a long piece, so hopefully we'll have time to get through it. But we do have a guest today. Remzo Martinez is going to join us at 8 o'clock. Blame Canada, blame Canada. Yes, uh, we're going to talk to Remzo Martinez at 8 a.m. Central Time. We're going to riff a little bit more on the NPR story, which is kind of the gift that keeps giving because the new head of National Public Radio has kind of been outed as a really hardcore, insane leftist in the style of Mother Jones and David Korn. So, Remzo's going to join us today. I know you guys are disappointed because Camellia's not going to be here today. Rah, rah, rah. Uh, yeah, sad. She uh, needed a day off. And you know what? We we don't pay her enough to be able to force her to stay here because, you know, actually we don't pay How her anything. How dare you? I know. Actually, she pays us. She helps us support the show with a monthly donation. Give it up for CJ. We love you. So we accommodate her schedule, and I try not to give her too hard of a time, but I think she's going to miss out because at 8.30 today, we're going to talk about uh, bad bitches only. I don't want no mediocre. Why we can't have pretty women in America anymore? We cannot enjoy beautiful no, women. It's God. wrong. No, God, Leftists please, Leftists no, will no, sexualize no, absolutely no. everything in this country, including children, except they will not sexualize 
a beautiful woman. No. You can't have beautiful women anymore in this country. Do you remember the 1980s when we used to have beautiful women on television? You used to be able to turn on the TV and you would find spectacular women with bodacious sex appeal. And it wasn't like, you know, uh, some of the stuff would be uh, auspicious if you went to Hollywood films or movie theaters and things like that and be like, oh, okay, well, that's a little bit too much going overboard with like the ridiculous gigantism of the you know what's. But you used to be able to watch a television show and the females were hot. They knew they were hot. They acted hot. The producers treated them like they were hot. The cameramen photographed them like they were hot. They made them look amazing and appealing. And you can't have that anymore. You cannot have a beautiful woman being sexualized. If you have a beautiful woman, if you happen to have a beautiful woman on a television show or even in Hollywood movies these days, that you actually cast a beautiful woman, which doesn't happen as often. But if you do cast one, you have to make her look less attractive. And they do. They cover it up with makeup or they choose an unattractive outfit. Uh, they, they've become, the left has become the new anti-sex, sex negative, they call that. The sex negative puritanical prudes. Uh, not that the right doesn't have that uh, segment, but it's not the 1980s anymore. And in the 1980s, no one listened to the evangelical right or the moral majority when it came to how we viewed female beauty in society. We all were just kind of like, oh, okay, yeah, even if we took our kids to church on Sunday, dad uh, would have a beer and watch Charlie's Angels in the evening, right? It was something that we just took for granted that it was okay for men to appreciate beautiful women. That's not okay anymore. We now have to take uh the we now have the triumph of the mediocre woman it's what it is is that because of diversity equity and inclusion standards uh because feminism has won and we live in a gynocracy we have to take media we have to take mediocre mids and we have to lift them all up and they're all tens i mean watch any of these like uh podcasts that you see some of the biggest podcasts like the whatever podcast or fresh and fit podcast and they ask them how would you rank yourself they're all 10s. I'm a 10. I'm a 10. I'm a 10. I'm a 10. And then not only do they live in a delusion, but we all have to nod and live in their delusional world. Well, men who play video games are not quite as easily bowed to the leftist progressive woke causes when it comes to uh, women in video games specifically, because uh, a viral post on Twitter where a, a man took a female character in a video game and then gave her a makeover and made her more beautiful. She was styled after an actual real life model, a beautiful woman, and they downgraded her. I'll show you the pictures a little bit later when we get into the segment. It's gonna be an interesting show. I think that you'll wanna stick around uh, and make sure that you click the like button and follow the channel if it's your first time here. Okay, so do us a favor. Uh, if you want to send us a text, you can at 5733. I got to stop saying do us a favor. Uh, send us a text on the number that you see on the screen, which is 573-319-1586. What's up, Hammer Lagger? It's been a while, man. Nice to see you. Uh, Joni Rankin says it was the 80s when I predicted men would have their day being our new sex symbols. No, actually, it's not like men are not sex symbols because they take men and they put them in dresses. And they're kind of like, that's a sex symbol. I mean, you know, this is obviously a woman here on the cover of Glamour magazine in UK, trans, pregnant, and proud, right? Logan Brown, right? That's supposed to be a man according to them if you're pregnant that's a female the female has undergone a transition is now pretending to be a male so that is i guess that is the sex symbol right there that's a sex symbol. <laughs> it's not sexy right i remember when it was controversial when remember when demi moore did the cover of a magazine in the 19 early 90s she was naked and pregnant on the cover of the magazine, and it was a big controversy over whether or not pregnant women could be sexy. I don't know if you can remember all the way back. Some of you might be too young to remember this controversy, but I certainly do. It was huge for weeks. You know, moms were, you know, like, you know, harassing everybody about this. I'm pregnant and I'm sexy. I'm pregnant and I'm sexy. 
And while it's true that some women are sexy and they're pregnant, um, you know, the the reality is is that not all of them are, ladies. I mean, you're going to be pregnant. You're going you're to be sexy to your man who loves you and thinks you're beautiful. Some women are sexy and pregnant. Demi Moore, put her on the cover of a magazine. We used to be that we idealized ideal beauty, and Demi Moore used to be that. But now we sort of idealize this crap where you see a woman who is look trying to look like a man with a gigantic engorged belly uh painted on suit and this is supposed to be what we're going to find beautiful well this isn't demi moore a beautiful woman pregnant on the cover of a magazine you can say objectively say this is a beautiful woman it doesn't matter that she's pregnant right and men whether you like it or not ladies men were not like programmed to find you sexy as when you're pregnant. And that's probably an evolutionary defense mechanism is in order to keep men away from you while you are taking care of a child, right? Well, you know, if you had a bunch of men going after you while you're pregnant and things like that, things would probably get out of hand. Just, you, I know women don't like men's nature and that's what this is all about. This is all about the destruction of the biological male and our, and our nature and the, destruct the destruction of the female as well, right? This is all about the destruction of biological sex Right, they're trying to to hack us and narrow us down until we eventually become completely androgynous, and they've eliminated the idea of sex uh, and gender entirely. But the point is, is that here it's no it's no doubt. There's, I mean, they're they're trying to show to make you say, "This is beautiful," when it's quite obviously this is disgusting, and I find this horrific and quite ugly. Uh, it's ugly. It's fine. You can live your life as you want to see. Not not everybody's a beauty queen. Not everybody's a ten. Not very few people are tens. Most people are nines. Uh, back in my twenties, maybe I was an eight for a short period, but you know we've notched it down a peg. And like on a average day, I might be a six. When I'm really like in shape and you know eating healthy and working out, then I might touch a seven at some point. Right? We can't all be tens. Right? We can't all be nines. We can't all be eights. But what you're looking at right here is like a two, okay? You're looking at a female two, and they're putting it on the cover because they want to destroy our conception of beauty because I do think that beauty aligns with virtue to an extent, right? There is a there is a sort of, a, and, and, and some social scientists, especially right-wing social scientists have put these concepts together, beauty, truth, and virtue, right? As like sort of a, a triumvirate, uh, not sure how much, uh, I would necessarily grant that, but I would say, let's just say for the benefit of the doubt that truth, beauty, and virtue go together. Here we have, uh, on this cover, we have the complete opposite of, of what is truthful, beautiful, or virtuous. So what is the left doing? They're undermining the values that hold together a society to create instability so that they can, of course, usher in a leftist, communist, totalitarian, egalitarian revolution. Can I get an email? Grover Bentley says, I may be pushing it four on a Florida beach, but I'm a solid 10 in a Walmart in Eastern Kentucky. Very funny. Uh, yes, I'm probably a, a solid eight in Eastern Kentucky. There you are. Um, if you're enjoying the show this morning, make sure that you click that like button and follow as well. I'll be glad to have you here on the Wake Up America show, joining us Mondays through Fridays, 7 to 9 a.m. Central Time. Let's get to the, uh, the other content that I was hoping to share with you guys today. Katie Kirk is getting criticized for some of the comments she made on Bill Maher's uh, podcast where they get high and they talk about whatever. Uh, but Bill Maher makes some solid points about Donald Trump here that I thought you guys would like. Take a listen. A listen Remember to the town hall he had on CNN about six months ago, and the audience loved it. The audience loved it. I mean, you can't, you can hate it. It was stacked with Trump supporters. Well, they said Republicans and independents. That's what they said. Okay, maybe it was. How'd they get in? If they did, that's on CNN. I, yeah, I agree. <clears throat> I think then it is on CNN, a, and the vetting process well, was— Well, then you got to get a better audience person. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's like the person who handed the gun to Alec Baldwin. Okay, so for—that's <laughs> pretty funny. So for those who, who don't know, some of you might know, right? But Jerry Springer, the uh, Oprah back in the days, any of those talk shows, Katie Couric's talk shows, whenever they have live audiences, it's hard to get a live audience to show up every day. If I were to do the Wake Up America show, 
with a live audience every single day, I wouldn't be able to fill the, the spots every single day. People are busy, they have lives, and so what they do is they'll typically have a paid audience. Uh, um, or they will just like recruit, give out like vouchers or things like that, or like coupons and sometimes giveaways. So if you show up, you might win something. Um, and so Katie Cura goes out there and she gets audiences. And of course, they're going to bring along people who agree with her. So Bill Maher is kind of pointing out that like, you know, she, Katie Couric is living in a media bubble to an extent, which is a really good point. Just people like her need to hear things like this. Okay, maybe it was. How'd they get in? If they did, that's on CNN. I, yeah, I agree. <clears throat> I think then it is on CNN, a, and the vetting process well, was... Well, then you got to get a better audience person. Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's like the person who handed the gun to Alec Baldwin. Yeah. You know, <laughs> got to get good people in all these positions. I agree. Or, okay, so if that was about... Whatever, if, even if it was, here's what happened. Here's what he, he, people saw in America. They saw Trump killing it, killing it with the crowd. Then you come to a panel of six people who all just do nothing but dump on him and call him a liar. And America goes, oh, didn't you just see that we like him? And He's now, not a stand-up comedian. What? He's killing it. He's not a stand-up comedian. No, but popular, it doesn't matter. He, the people Correct. loved him and what he was saying. And then you cut to a panel of six know-it-alls in Washington who just do nothing but talk about the negative. And like, I'm all in on the negative. No one's been harder on Trump than me, but I get Yeah, tr I mean, it's not like Bill Maher doesn't have Trump derangement syndrome too, but at least he sees what's happening. He's calling it out. I, I really think that if it weren't for Trump, Bill Maher would probably be like an open conservative at this point, or at least a libertarian. Get it, and I'm bored with it. And there's a different way to, to do this, I think, which so is how, to- So what is it? The, is to not to defend Trump, but to defend the people who still vote for him because what they- Blue Trike over in the Rumble chat says he kind of is a stand-up comedian. He is, right? <laughs> Gavin McKinnon calls him his favorite comedian because Trump does say funny stuff. I mean, sometimes on accident, but a lot of times he says things that he knows are funny and that are gonna get a laugh out of people. And it come. works. Do not come. I'm gonna come. <laughs> but listen. Oh. <laughs> I love that that part right there at the very end. Oh, uh, I almost forgot, guys. Before we continue on with this Katie Couric part of this, uh, the Wake Up America Show bonus program is open and ready to rock. To, this week, uh, some of the biggest themes in libertarianism and yesterday we did the question about whether or not taxation is theft if you would like to see today's bonus mini documentary and i think you really do i made something a little special for you today to go on top there's a cherry on top of the bonus content for you today which i think you're really going to enjoy so if you'd like to see that bonus content then you've got to make sure that you get those rumble rants in before the end of the show today so if in this two-hour stretch we raise at least $50 in Rumble Rants, YouTube Super Chats, uh, donations, or in purchases at APForLibertyShop.com, then you will unlock today's bonus content. Really quick, uh, we do have a brand new, beautiful uh, stained glass cutting board that I made yesterday of President Calvin Coolidge. So that might be a good thing to buy. Head on over to um, APForLibertyShop.com. Uh, Erz Mommy says, I was swigging coffee. Thanks for that, AP for Liberty. What was it that you, oh, the, uh, the, <laughs> the Trump clip. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, that's one of the fun things about the Wake Up America show, guys, is that we always get, we tend to have a good laugh here. We talk about serious subjects, but we always like to goof around. So if you'd like to like to unlock today's bonus content, then this, the, the Calvin Coolidge stained glass cutting board is quite a statement uh i mean think about this when your guests come over and you hand them a charcuterie uh and as soon as they like start clearing off the brie and the water crackers uh they see a beautiful stained glass image of our 30th president calvin coolidge silent cal head on over to ap for liberty shop.com i designed this myself obviously using ai of course but i was the one who had to 
sit down. It takes a lot of generation times and a lot of like futzing and finagling in Photoshop to actually get this stuff right. So trust me, it's not like boom, boom, wham, bam. Thank you, ma'am. This Calvin Coolidge stained glass cutting board is available exclusively at apforlibertyshop.com. And let me tell you something. And Stephanie's going to go on this off on this rant a little bit more in her new hustling and homemaking video that's coming out soon. But I went to we went to Monticello and I'm gonna be real with you. Okay, the merch at Monticello sucked big time. It was bad. It was terrible. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, they did him dirty, right? They do not like Thomas Jefferson at Monticello. And you can tell by the way people talk about him who work there. You can tell from the type of merchandise that they have there that is completely unrelated to Thomas Jefferson. They do not have a revolutionary spirit at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello at all. It's honestly, it's, you know, the whole place is pretty much run by chicks. And so they have little ornaments that are crappy and like cutesy. And there's just no badass revolutionary patriotic spirit. You can't bring guns there. You can't smoke there. You can't have any, no soon, no drinking, no, no fun and no talking. Like they had a party that was going on there and they had a little area where it was okay to drink alcohol and stuff it was like, Jeez, man, like they got terrible merch. So if you like good merch, head on over to ap4libertyshop.com. That's AP, the number four, ap4libertyshop.com. You guys do not want to miss the bonus content today. I'm telling you because, 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 because of the wonderful things he does. Da, 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 da. Yes, the uh, AP for Liberty, sh um, the bonus content today has an extra special little cherry on top. I think you want to see it, but it goes away forever if we don't unlock it. So get those donations in. Okay, let's continue with uh, Bill Maher and Katie Couric talking about- They Trump. see on the other side, to them is even more dangerous because it's very closer to home. My kid is coming home from school and he thinks he's a racist. He's uh -huh. five. What have you been telling him? Uh -huh. You know, uh -huh. my, my son thinks maybe he like he's not this. a boy and maybe that's true, that happens, but- you know, those kind of things are what they say. That's why I'm voting for Trump. I, a, a backlash a, to well, the, the pendulum swinging. Conservative so far to guy the left. once said to me, "What you don't get about Trump is we don't like him either." Now that's not true for all people. There are people who just love his dirty draws, mm -hmm. and they are dirty. But <laughs> lots of people, it's like that. We don't like him, but he's all yeah. that stands between us and madness. Yeah, that's their view. So that, you, I would like so, that view presented. It's true, which is, again, not to say that what we're about to hear from Katie Couric doesn't actually make some good points. As a Donald Trump elected delegate, I can tell you that when I was at the caucus a couple of weeks ago, um, it was not a pretty sight. Uh, let's listen to what Katie Couric has and to say. And I feel like, to your point, Bill, the socioeconomic disparities are a lot and class resentment is a lot what, and anti-intellectualism and elitism is what is driving many of these, these anti-establishment, which are Trump voters, right. or anti-establishment voters. So I think that is a huge problem that we have to address. I mean, globalization and, you know, the transition from an industrial to a technological so, society. I mean, I... I and I don't know if you've ever been jealous of some what someone else has or resentful. It is such a corroding and um, bitter, almost bile <laughs> feeling. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to need to go through uh, what Katie Couric is saying here piece by piece because some of what she says is absolutely true. Some of it she needs to hold up the mirror of self-reflection to. So let's continue this with noting, and what I'm about to say to you here, this is how you know that I'm honest with you, okay? This is how you know that I'm different from other like right-wing pundits or wake up like, like show hosts, right-wing podcasters and things like this. They would, they're all this morning ripping on Katie Couric. They're all calling her out for these kinds of statements. They're they're tearing her to pieces, saying you know that she's saying this when in reality she's actually saying that. When you watch the Wake Up America show, you're going to hear things that sometimes are are going to clang on the ear. That means that you're hearing my true unbiased opinion. I'm not telling you what I think you want to hear in order to get more views or to grow my show or to make more money. Which speaking of, Mighty Megatron just dumped a couple bucks to tip jar. Thank you. He says. 
The Tree of Liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. Yes, and Drummer Goy says getting things started. Who's next? Thank you, brothers. The tree is thirsty. We are $12 towards our $50 goal of opening up today's bonus content. You don't want to miss it. I made a nice little cherry on top of the extra bonus content for you this week's theme. Big ideas in the uh, libertarian uh, philosophy. Okay, uh, so we're going to go through this piece by piece. It's a 58-second clip, but Katie Couric says a lot here, okay? And we need to take it a bit by and bit. And I okay. feel like, to your point, Bill, the socioeconomic disparities are a lot and class resentment is a lot what and and pause so um in turn she's saying here what is driving donald trump voters or people to support donald trump or to be maga so she's saying that some of it is class uh, socioeconomic status and class resentment very true because it, it, we have seen the republican party um, moving away from the sort of country club, Republican Mitt Romney, you know, elitist corporate kind of type people, more to a blue collar, middle class, lower middle class party, right? We have seen that transition away. It used to be that the Democrats were the party of the blue collars of, of the middle class to the middle lower class. That has started to change. So her analysis of this as being as as being sort of a a tension between classes could absolutely be true. But let's continue on with some of her other claims when she's talking about intellectualism Mac. and elitism is what is driving many of these these anti-establishment, which are Trump voters. Right. Are anti Very true. Again, she's correct here. Is that that a the the populism that is on the right is a revolt against the elites it's not to say that there isn't left-wing populism and that they're not having their own battle over there on the left they absolutely are thank you robbie who says the tree is thirsty and donates twenty dollars in the tip jar thank you thirty two dollars raised towards our fifty dollar goal if we raise at least fifty dollars by the end of the show you'll unlock today's bonus content which has a sweet little cherry on top to start you don't want to miss it so get those donations in or head over to apforlibertyshop.com. You could go buy the Calvin Coolidge glass cutting board right now, and then it'd be unlocked, okay? Uh, Quantum Kitty says $10. She says, thank you. $42 raised. She says, I don't always agree with you, AP, but I always value your direct, consistent, filled with common sense and real. You work to be consistent even when it isn't convenient. Yes, in, in this conversation here with Katie Couric, it's not convenient for me. I would be better off if I just blasted her, didn't dissect her, didn't think about what she's saying at all. Uh, and just told you what I know, for the most part, most of the audience on Rumble wants to hear. Now, you, if you're my Cantina Crew fan, a regular guest, you know my kind of my mindset. You're used to me saying things that kind of clang on the ear rather than smoothly go in one side and then out the other. Uh, but for a lot of the new people here, it's tough. It's tough to to win new people when when you don't always give the red meat. So let's let's analyze what she's saying here she's talking about the uh, a revolt against the elite very true anti-establishment which are trump voters right. are anti-establishment yes very true trump voters are very anti-establishment again so we haven't hit we haven't heard anything yet from katie couric that she uh, that she has said that necessarily would make us feel resentful towards her yet but let's Absolutely. continue voters so i think that is a huge problem that we have to address. I mean, globalization and, you know, the transition from an industrial to a technological. So That's a big statement. And I wish that Bill Maher was not stoned out of his mind and could have actually pressed her on that because that's a fascinating conversation that he could have opened up. When, he ta when she talks about globalization and the move from an industrial society to a technological society, those are ideas. Those are big ideas and i would be fascinated to interview katie couric about her thoughts on this one because there is a lot of tension in the modern world of the transition from an industrial society to a technological one and we see this in the push on the right for things like tariffs and for things like the government to step in and we don't want to bail out banks and big corporations and insurance companies no we want to bail out U.S. steel, and we want to bail out manufacturers of aluminum. We don't want to, but you know, so see, it's but it's still that same mindset that we've had, where it is a progressive solution to a capitalistic problem. Okay, so when Katie Couric says that the Trump supporters here are 
uh, feeling a tension because of this move away from an industrialized society to a technological one. It's it's the tale as old as time. I mean, imagine you know during the the period of the move away from an agrarian society to an industrial society. I mean, we had a civil war in this country in large part because of those tensions. Consider that while slavery itself was a primary impetus for the civil war. Notice I said a primary Im impetus, not the primary impetus, but a primary impetus. But while slavery was a primary impetus, the reason why slavery's impetus, the, 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 the reason why there was so much tension surrounding it, of course, were these economic factors that would have probably seen the end of slavery, even if there hadn't been a civil war, simply because of the, uh, the move away from an agrarian society to an industrial one, right? So Southern plantation owners wanted to try and remain in a system that allowed them to profit off an agrarian, largely agrarian society in a, in a business model that didn't make sense. They were fighting to maintain an economic system that benefited them, in, and they resisted the industrialist North that was able to be so much more productive than them because the, the North had, and while I will say progressive, I don't mean progressive in the political sense, but they had a more progressive view of advancing uh, a society towards an industrial society. And this was the rise of a populist party at the time, the rise of the populist party called the Know Nothings. Um, this is a fascinating uh, case study in American history. If you've never taken the time, I would highly recommend that you sit down and read about the Know Nothing movement of the late 1800s. These are people who were deeply suspicious of the move away from uh, American society, from agrarian society to industrialized society. And there was a lot of political backlash to this. Uh, Abraham Lincoln actually, because he was so nervous about the political sway of the Know Nothing parties, he never said anything about them negatively publicly, but he did uh, criticize them in his private diaries and his writings. So if you'd like to get an, maybe that, maybe I should do um, a Wake Up America show bonus uh, history documentary on populist movements of the United States. Maybe next week. What do you guys think? Would that be a good idea? Uh, thank you, Mighty Megatron, for another uh, $2 in the tip jar. Looks like we're at uh, $44 raised. So $44 raised. Thank you very much, friends. He says, Gotta love these out of touch reality millionaire F wits, how we the working folks are in the wrong and they think they can relate to us. Gotta love first world rich people mentality. Yes, and 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 we're gonna get to my criticisms of Katie Kirk here in just a moment. Sorry to go on a tangent here, but I mean what she said, this is a big brain idea. Katie Kirk is not stupid. Okay. She she may be wrong about things, she may be a hypocrite, she may be unable, she may have huge blind spots on. But she has, uh, people are much better at criticizing, seeing other people's wrongs than they are and seeing their own. We all are. We all have blind spots to ourselves and our flaws. It's just, it's Stephanie and I were talking about this last week. It's just tale as old as time. We're much better at picking the, uh, sand, the speck of sand out of someone else's eye than we are the huge beam in ours, right? So to, not to get all biblical on you, this one here. But there is a lot of tension in the United States today about the move away from uh, an industrial society. Now we're moving away from an industrial society, you know, manufacturing our own steel, manufacturing our own products to a large extent. Not that we don't manufacture our own products. We absolutely do. As a matter of fact, the United States manufactures more products than like the next three largest countries combined after the United States. I think China manufactures more, but after this, it's like Canada, Mexico, and some other large country, I can't remember, I just read this just last week, I should have memorized it, or I should have brought it on the show to share with you guys. And I'm, I'm sorry for that. But please take it from me when I tell you that the United States still does absolutely manufacture goods here. However, we are transitioning away from an industrial society to a technological society. And that creates tension. And that's and because people who formerly worked in factories or had good jobs, good paying jobs, you know, manufacturing things in the past, think that we need to have the government step in and protect that way of life because it worked for them. It doesn't work for us, okay? It doesn't work for my generation. We don't have 28 years at a corporation or a, a factory, and then at the end of our career, we get really nice benefits and a pension and a gold watch and, and you know, and a nice retirement uh, uh, pay. It, 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 the only people who get to do that are people who go and work for the government, typically. 
so the the economy has changed and it feels as if the older generations and not to specifically always point figures to the boomers or anything here but the boomers got to live that lifestyle and so they want to try and shape the government to protect that lifestyle because it was good for them but it's not good for us i i think i can speak pretty safely for my generation and younger generation z that it's not an idealized situation for them to try and go and work for some corporate, you know, a-hole and bleed their life away under, you know, not even, L I guess, LEDs now these days, uh, bleed their life away in, in the, under LEDs and, and have to drive to work downtown five days a week uh, and have to commute and fight in traffic with other people and spend less time with their families and more money on gas and more money on food and all these things. It's just, it's not a lifestyle that my people my age or younger want to lead, right? We're moving away from an industrial society where we manufacture things by hand and we're moving towards a society. I'm sorry to go on such a long rant about this, but I just I have very, very strong feelings about this. Uh, we're moving away from an industrial society and we're moving towards a technological society. I, think about what it is that I'm doing right now. In order to make my bread at the end of the day today, I have to make a certain amount of money during this two hour show. I have to run all of this tech. I have to produce all sorts of content. I have to you know, pressure and advertise and cajole people to buy products, right? In order to ensure the safety and security and the well being of my family. I've adapted to live in a technological society. The content that I produce is ephemeral, the, the, but, the, but it's still a product. And it's a product that you all are willing to pay for, right? This is a digital product that I'm producing that produces value for you in which exchange you give me money, right? Now, I also have a part of my business which produces actual goods that I can then ship to you, but I don't manufacture these goods, right? I I, I am a developer, right? So the United, she says that we're moving towards a technological society. That is really kind of a big broad, um, big, broad way of looking at it. But what we're really becoming is a developer nation. I develop these ideas, I develop these products, I develop an app uh, for our phone, I develop an idea, I develop this, uh, this content, I develop, I'm developing these things, and I outsource the manufacturing of these products to someone else. It makes no sense for me to manufacture products. As a matter of fact, if you'll notice, Stephanie and I, in order to figure out how to be most efficient with our business and most effective, we actually have moved largely away from manufacturing products in our own house because it's a very, it's not a, the best business model for us to run a 3D printer farm and to consistently be manufacturing new 3D printed objects. Yeah, there's money in it, but the amount of time that we spend making those things and producing them by hand and shipping them out box after box after box after box, it, it eventually like you realize you're making like five or six dollars an hour with the hours and hours of time that you put into manufacturing far better for me to hire an outsource a third party in order to create products for that for us and then send those off to you right so all of that is a very long way to say that katie Couric makes a good point here in that the uh of the fear and the tension as we are changing we're going into a new epoch we're we're transitioning into a new era and the new era is one of technology, development, um, working from home, more quality time spent with friends and families and neighbors. I, I think that you know the greatest greatest generation and the boomer generation, they were not quite as uh, in touch. They didn't, and the the greatest generation didn't have time to develop themselves emotionally or to have relationships with their families, the kind that we really value today, in order to build bonds with our families and have strong mental health because they were in subsistence living they, they didn't have the time to nurture their boomer kids and now they're the boomer kids didn't really have the kind of language so much to nurture their children as much although they did a little bit more than millennials and now millennials are like you know becoming helicopter parents and they're over parenting and they're over overweening when it comes to mental health of their of their kids and I say this as a geriatric millennial who's about to have a child, right? I'm going to try not to be a helicopter parent. Um, but we, if we want better relationships with our family and better mental health, more time, quality time spent with them, then we move away from a manufacturing society. We move away from an industrial society where people show up at an office or at a factory and make things by hand 
Now robots, computers, technology, artificial intelligence does a lot of that for us. Still got to have some people over there, and they will be highly skilled and highly paid to do that to a developer nation where our minds, our uh, our intellect, our ability, our, our capacity to be creative will be a determinant of the future of the success of not my generation as much, although there is some, of course, um, but certainly subsequent generations will have to be creative, they'll have to be tech savvy, they'll have to uh, be self-sufficient, they'll have to be independent, they're going to have to have a plan for retirement that doesn't include social security and doesn't include a pension, most likely, unless they want to go to government work or do something, um, you know, in a nonprofit sector that gives them the kind of benefits that they can't get in the private market because they're just they're not coming back, right? The benefits are not coming back. Some benefits are coming are, are being created in order to bring people back in the workplace. So for example, I did see that some coffee shops have started offering childcare as a part of their uh, benefits to their employees. So certain new benefits will be created, despite the fact that the government is trying mightily right now to try and force laws on all of us for paid leave and maternity leave and all this kind of stuff. The government's trying to force this stuff. The free market is doing it. It's happening out there in the market because the market will respond to pressures from people. Right? I, I, I feel bad to an extent for people who have heavily invested in um, like downtown real estate or who have heavily invested in commercial real estate, for example, because there is a complete bust happening right now with commercial real estate. Uh, and the people don't want to return to the office. And that's fine. And, and I'm sorry to turn into this huge epic philosophical rant on this, guys. I know that we're supposed to be talking about other news topics, but I, I find this to be a fascinating one. So, so if we're not moving back downtown, what are we doing, right? We're going to have to build new community centers. We're going to have to have new places that are public spheres that aren't on the apps, right? So we can actually meet each other again and have relationships with one another again. But all this is a long drawn out way to say that when Katie Crook talks about globalization, right? Without globalization, AP for Liberty Shop doesn't exist. Okay. That, then, them's the facts. Okay. And I am not about to, I am not about to not take advantage of the forms of capitalism that people like Donald Trump used to make rich, okay? I own a Donald Trump tie. It was made in Bangladesh, okay? What do you think our president does? Now, here's the thing. He, he wants to pull the ladder up. I'm voting for the guy, but I have my disagreements with him on trade and economics, okay? He wants to pull the ladder up so that other people don't get to take advantage of the system that he got to take advantage of to get rich, okay? So if you think that I am not going to, that, that I should hold myself back and say, no, 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 I choose to impoverish my family. I choose not to try and be successful. I'm not gonna engage in international trade. I'm not going to do all this kind of stuff, but I'll, I'll be transparent with you and tell you exactly where the products come from that I manufacture, that we manufacture and sell at apforlibertyshop.com. Some of them are made right in our house, like our little 3D Buddhas. Some of them are made here in the United States. Some of them are made in Mexico. Some of them are made in China. And I will tell you transparently, if you don't want to do business with me based on that, that's fine. But it doesn't go against my principles. It doesn't go against my, it doesn't go against my principles to work with globalization and international free trade. They're accusing her of, of being a globalist or being for globalism, which is a different concept. Uh, it's a completely different concept. When they talk about globalism, they're talking about international government. Free trade is not international government, right? It's not the United Nations. It's not the, it's not, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, NATO. It's not the World Health Organization, right? Or the NIH or any of these, any of these inter supranational institutions. That's not globalization. It's globalism. And these terms get pe people who are so confused, especially because, you know, when she talks about anti-intellectualism amongst Trumpers, you think that that's a slight, that bothers you. Go to a GOP caucus, okay? Come with me. I'll, I'm going to the GOP convention, the state convention uh, on May the 4th, and I think that it's going to be better than the regional caucus was, but it's not smart people running run the show, okay? 
It's not, this is why the founding fathers, go to a GOP caucus with me. I'm sure the Democrats are as bad and much worse, trust me. But this is the best argument against democracy. Engage in it, right? Go get elected as a delegate, show up to your, your regional caucus. My county one was okay. The regional caucus, it's not good. It's not good, okay? They, they, it, it, it's, it's people. They're, they're voting based on fear, right? And they're, and they're, they, they, they flock, like, uh, like fish. Are they like they like like they're like schools of fish, right? Like they move together, like in and in, in like in fearful hordes. And it's easy to whip them up, right? That's why we have whips in Congress, right? Whip up the the schools of fish so that they turn this way and signal that way, right? And move people in herds, right? And I'm sitting here watching these. The people, you know, I'm watching the herd go this way, and I'm just like, boy, you guys are going right off a cliff. And they just they just charge right off, just right off. Buffaloes, the bu if we were a buffalo, they'd all be seeing the Native American, as, and I'd be like, yo, 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 the it's it, they ain't real buffalo. You guys are walking into a trap, and them's really as negative Native Americans, and y'all need to stop running towards that cliff. No, no, please, guys, don't run towards the cliff. Oh, buffalo jump. And here's me, and I probably still get eaten because I'm the lone one. I, I stuck out from the herd, and that's just what happens. That's why people herd up. Because if you're like me, or if you're like any, if you're any kind of an independent thinker in this world, you get eaten too. And that's why, it, and that is why it is probably so rare to be an independent thinker. If you think there's an evolutionary basis for this, where there's a reason why people tend to flock. There's a reason why people tend to school. There's a reason why people tend to herd and they have problems thinking outside of the group think because it's dangerous. It's not just dangerous from the perspective of if you don't stick with the herd that you are uh, that you are more likely to get eaten by a wolf or what have you, but you're also more likely to get burned at the stake for being a witch. Have you ever felt that way? I mean, have you ever thought about, you know, where you are when you see the crowds of people and they're running towards the truck, they're running towards the, the, uh, the, the cliff's edge and you're like, no, no, don't go, please stop. It's like, it's a cliff. It's a cliff. And they're all just like, and you're like, no, no, it's a cliff. It's a cliff. That's a native Americans. It's a trap. And they're like, oh, you're such a conspiracy theorist. And I was like, no, no, no. It's a, it was a lab leak. It came out from the Wuhan lab. No, shut up. Ah. <laughs> Anyways, what are you guys talking about over in the chat? Uh, if you're uh, just tuning into the Wake Up America show, good morning. I'm Austin Peterson. Glad to have you here. It's been a little weird this morning. I just kind of wanted to talk about what I wanted to talk about today. I didn't want to try and force too much. I am going to talk about the triumph of mediocre women here at about 8.30 a.m. Central Time. But a little bit less than 10 minutes from now, we're going to hear from uh, Remzo Martinez. Now would be a good time to get in that last $8 that we need to unlock the bonus content. Because wouldn't you guys rather see the bonus content than watch the commercials that I'm going to play to get Remzo in here? So now is your chance. Uh, either head over to ap4libertyshop.com, make a purchase in the next like three minutes here, or make a Rumble Rant donation. If we get at least eight bucks, that will unlock the bonus content. And instead of watching commercials, you guys can watch the bonus content. Wouldn't you like to see that? Yes, yes, I think you would. So like I said, head on over to ap4libertyshop.com. Uh, that's AP, the number four, ap4libertyshop.com, guys. Uh, and make yourself a purchase. Get that beautiful Calvin Coolidge cutting board up and do a little charcuterie party, party with that on there. So Intiga says, real lols. Nice to see you, Intiga. Hello. I think we've seen you here before a couple of times. I always love seeing new people, though. Um, and if you're enjoying the content today, too, you can support the show for free. Um, you can help us now by clicking that like button. And if it's your first time joining us, then hit the follow button as well. We'd love to have you come back and join us here on the show. The schedule is every Monday through Friday, 7 to 9 a.m. Central Time. You can also send us a check at, or excuse me, <laughs> you can send us a text. Check would be nice too. A text at 573-319-1586. That's 573-319-1586. One more time, 573 573- 
319-1586. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what's going on um, uh, uh, in the world and what we've talked about this morning. Let me check the text. Someone listener, one listener texted in this morning says, hey man, I'm just here to bang. What? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that uh, I've got a shirt over at APforLibertyShop.com that says uh, I'm just here to bang. So, uh, all right, looks like we didn't hit our $50 goal just yet. Aww. So, but don't worry, we're not gonna. I don't think we're gonna miss it. We just need to raise eight more dollars, and then we can. Uh, you guys can unlock the bonus content, which means that we're gonna do a little commercial no, break. Yep. God. Yes. No, yes. God, please, no. Yes. No, no it's going to be a brief no. commercial break. Trust no. me. When we get back, we're going to talk to Remzo Martinez about that crazy white lady over at NPR and all the weird, insane tweets. Talk to her about that. Maybe the Libertarian Party a little bit and what happened with that piece. All that and more when we get back on the Wake Up America show at wakeupamericashow.com. Expanse of time, a year might seem like a mere moment, but oh, what a year it's been. In September 2022, Austin and Stephanie Peterson embarked on a journey, a journey to wake up America. They began humbly, with just 20 souls tuning in, learning, listening, and though challenges arose, like the looming shadow of YouTube demonetization, their spirit never waned. And now, thanks to you, thousands rise with the sun to join them, to listen, to engage, to be a part of a community. So here's to you and to wake up America. For memories shared, for friends made, for the journey ahead, and for never, ever forgetting to rise and freedom. Happy anniversary. I'm Donald Trump and I approve this message. Believe me, Austin Peterson is the best. He's got the greatest Wake Up America show I've ever seen. Whenever I tune in in the mornings and watch the live stream, let me tell you, he has got the absolute best all right, guys. Well, we're one dollar away from the goal. Sign of Jonah made a donation to sign them out of seven dollars so that you guys can see his videos. He wants you guys to check out his new song, Real Love, Breathe, Publicity. Uh, that was a brilliant move, by the way. And thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and play the bonus content for you because you guys have definitely earned it. You know that I love you, even though you're one dollar away from the goal. Hopefully, somebody will make a purchase by the end of the show or something like that. So we do hit the real goal. But I'll go ahead and say close enough for government work here. You guys enjoy your bonus history video and the little cherry on top at the beginning of today's bonus content. And I'll be back with Remzo Martinez. Austin Peterson calls, you answer the light. Fueling our show through day and night. With every tea, every cool design. You unlock the world supremely fine. Coffee to stickers, merch in your hands. Every dollar helps expand our plans. Wake up America, feel the vibe. Austin's here with the tribe. Your support's the key, you spark the flame. Thanks to you, we're up in the game. Is a lottery a tax? Yes, in fact, it is the holy grail in the art of taxation. A completely voluntary tax, and one that even George Washington made good use of to help build the roads. Lotteries provide public funds while being voluntarily contributed to by individuals through ticket purchases. It's a tax on people who are bad at math, says financial guru Dave Ramsey. Jean-Baptiste Colbert, Louis XIV's finance minister, once noted that effective taxation involves minimal complaint for maximum revenue, much like a lottery enticing people with hope while subtly extracting money. In 1990, Louisiana introduced a lottery, prompting Mississippi legislators to reconsider their stance despite a constitutional ban and ongoing issues with charitable bingo parlors. Louisiana's venture into casinos drawing funds from Mississippi residents eventually led Mississippi to enter the casino market as well, proving lucrative for the state. Decades have passed, yet the moral debates around state-sponsored gambling persist. Mississippi's financial struggles and infrastructure woes have softened opposition to a lottery, highlighted by the spectacle of residents playing out-of-state lotteries. Mississippi contemplates joining the multitude of states with lotteries, questioning the timing and potential financial benefits amid long-standing moral and economic considerations. Historical data from the first state lotteries dating back over 50 years offers insights into potential outcomes with recent analysis suggesting a lottery could significantly impact Mississippi's finances. 
Yet the opposition to expansion of the lottery harkens back to the old coalitions of Baptists and bootleggers. Progress is halted by two parties of differing worldviews united for a common cause, prohibition. House Speaker Philip Gunn's shift from opposition to neutrality on the lottery issue underscores the evolving debate, with analysis indicating $1.83 to $94 million annual net tax gain for Mississippi. This net gain considers potential losses in sales tax revenue as money spent on lottery tickets diverts funds from taxable goods potentially affecting jobs and the state's GDP. The demographic most likely to play the lottery, often those with lower incomes, raises concerns about the ethical implications of targeting financially vulnerable populations. If only poor people play the lottery, then the lottery is considered a regressive tax. Is that a better way to fund government? Millennials' decreasing interest in lotteries, preferring other forms of entertainment and investment, suggests changing attitudes that could impact future lottery sales. If that's the case, then it might not be a viable option for the future. Casino tax revenue has seen its own cycle of growth and decline, reflecting broader trends in gambling preferences and competition. If more gambling is legalized, it may make it harder to fund government through such a system. Although if government is smaller, then that does make it an easier prospect. The public's demand for services without the appetite for overt taxation creates a dilemma for lawmakers who seek unobtrusive methods of funding, akin to Colbert's taxation philosophy. It may be wise for us to have a nuanced debate around lotteries as a mix of hope, taxation, and public policy, inviting further discussion on their role in state finances. Good morning, rise and freedom. Welcome back to the Wake Up America show with Austin Peterson, that's me. Glad to have you here. Hope you're enjoying the content this morning. Did you guys like the bonus content? How about that beautiful new song that we produced for that? You guys liking that or what? It's been a lot of fun creating all of this special, unique content. I think that might be in large part why we're getting so successful, but it also might be that we also get a lot of um, help from rumble.com featuring us on the front page. What's up, Rumble? How you doing, guys? I think for many of you who are joining us live here this morning of the 550 some odd people joining us there for the very first time, if you enjoy this content, you're definitely gonna wanna come back. And instead of fumbling around tomorrow morning with the remote or the mouse and being like, what was that show called? How do I find it on Rumble? Just hit the follow button. Just click that follow button right now so you don't have to worry about it. The show schedule is Mondays through Fridays. 7 to 9 a.m. Central Time. The Wake Up America Show is a great way to find out what's happening in the world to fight for your rights, economic freedom, and personal liberty. That's what we stand for. We stand for truth, justice, and the American way. That's right. We just want to wake up America. All right, nice little double entendre. Ur's mommy dropping in the tip jar says she's got nothing to rant about at this moment. Well, glad to have you here anyway. We thank you for the support. All right, well, Remzo Martinez, he and I have known each other for quite some time. We go way back. We used to work together when I was publishing the Libertarian Republic on the regs. Well, now he's got a project, a new project that he has been taking viral. It's growing like crazy. I love having Remzo on the show, especially because we can celebrate all of his success as the managing editor of AmpAmerica.com, more of which I'm a weekly writer. What's up, Remzo? How you doing, brother? Austin. It is great to be on with you and your audience this early in the morning to wake up America. Yeah, we're glad to have you here, brother. You've got a lot of insight on politics in the world today because you've been working behind the scenes uh, with so many candidates and so many uh, liberty and conservative and Republican and right-wing publications that very few people have as much insight into what's happening in the world of politics, which is why I'm glad to have you here. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about NPR, our competitor. Um, April 15th, tax day, yesterday, I wrote a massive check to the federal government. Um, everybody who's on welfare, uh, all I can say is you're welcome. Um, part of that check goes to fund NPR, which if you're listening to NPR, you're not listening to the Wake Up America show. Uh, and uh, Shame. Shame. Yes, yes, Remzo. Shame. Um, I mean, I guess thoughts on defunding NPR, thoughts on the recent controversy with this guy who said, you know, 86 Republicans, zero Democrats, and now they hate him. What's what are your thoughts on this? Years ago, I was in D.C. for a uh, Concerned Women of America 
rally. And at the same time, because when you're single, that's where you go. Right. Um, and when I was there, they were also going through another round of, um, you know, defund NPR type of stuff as well. And I, I just remember in 2012, everyone was like, Mitt Romney wants to kill Big Bird. This is education for the poor. This is, it's not like we have public schools and all that other stuff, you know, and the internet available for the poor. I think Khan Academy has taught more people than uh, Sesame Street, but who do I see like walking around, like lobbying? being to keep NPR alive. I see these people in like, you know, ballroom gowns and black ties of their support, the arts, support education. And I'm just like, this is not like, you know, the little people that we thought about. These people are probably high net worth individuals who should absolutely be funding this themselves. NPR does obtain uh, taxpayer funding. They are also partially privately funded. We're looking at it at this point and we're like, when you look at the cost, I mean, is it really worth masterpiece classics? Like, you know, with PBS and everything else, like, is it really worth any of that? Like, who is listening to NPR for groundbreaking news? <laughs> uh, my sister-in-law. Uh, she, 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 she lives in San Francisco and listens to NPR. Um, but I, listen, you and I, I mean, we're not stupid. We've been around and we know the media. We know that NPR has always leaned left. But I think we didn't quite rec realize just how, like, confirmed i mean just how confirmed leftist that npr editors are this yuri berliner comes out did this homework did real journalism at npr and said the voter registrations in dc show 86 democrat editors zero republican editors over at npr a swath of reporting that he did on things like um the, here's how we handled Adam Schiff and Russiagate. Completely didn't do, issue any retractions. Um, here's how many of the editors were Republicans versus Democrats. I mean, he just demolitioned his workplace. I mean, and I don't know if you read, did you see that they're worried about making him a martyr? Did you see this? Oh, he's going to be on like, I don't know, what, what's a right wing network that takes old old liberals? Tucker, oh, the uh, Tucker Carlson network. <laughs> he'll be with he'll be with Barry Wise. He'll be yeah, with that yeah. guy who's always with Jordan Peterson. I mean, he's he's about to become part of the intellectual dark web tomorrow, and he'll be on tour throughout the country next week. <laughs> well, that's because it, and, that's the cycle. But that's the thing is now NPR has to like he has spread infection, right? He's 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 like. Uh, He's like, what's the, the slave who's like told and telling them of freedom, right? They don't want that there. They don't want they don't want people, you know, poisoning the well with any kind of ideological diversity. I laughed so hard, Remzo, when I read this story yesterday. Uh, it was on the Daily Beast, and the last comment that the lady, the new NPR chief, says is that she says she says we have lots of diversity here. As a matter of fact, we're hiring a half black woman to take over as new editor. Blah blah blah. And I'm just kind of like. <laughs> Heavy breathing. Just, just take it in and process it for a moment. Like they, they don't get it, Remzo. Why don't they get it? They're, they're, they're incapable. I mean, for years we, we used to make fun of the left as being NPCs, and now it's at the point where it's just like you know, I want to believe that there's like you know, two brain cells to go ahead and put a logical conclusion together when you observe the space around you and you start to assess that maybe I'm part of the problem. It's like that. Um, I think it's a Monty Python skit from years ago where you had the two Nazis in the trenches and the one guy looks at the other and he's like, Hans, are we the baddies? Are we it's the like, baddies? No. <laughs> no. Like we got the scars and we're grabbing the Jews and we're going invading <laughs> the Polands and the UK and we're lobbying the bums of people. Are we the bad guys? It's like that's the situation we're we're in. And um, they, you know, they, they're always the people that cause the problem. They're always the people who are responsible for solving the problem. And then they appoint themselves to solve the problem. And then they make it seem like the problem was everybody else. The, the problem isn't that NPR is not diverse enough. The problem is, is that NPR does not even see that there is an issue there, that when you only swing one way, you create this echo chamber where you become part victim to it. You are the perpetrator and you are the victim to it. So, you know, the, the only thing left is to just continue ignoring them. I <laughs> think that's the best thing we could do. Well, like they, listen, they confirmed what we knew for years. I found the article. Here it is. So the it's from the Daily Beast. It says NPR chief said she didn't want Yuri, Yuri Berliner to become a martyr 
according to this report. So they say that they are, they're essentially, they're terrified that if they make an example of, they fire him, that, uh, that he's, you know, they're afraid he's going to be, you know, good doing exactly what you said. But here's the final sentence on this one. Dude, this shit's so funny. Listen to this. Some staff members also sent each other internal messages disagreeing with Yuri Berliner's points about a lack of ideological diversity and said, quote, efforts to recruit more people of color would make NPR's journalism better. Efforts to recruit more people of color that will make us more with ideological diversity. What is that? As if black people and white people can't hold the same opinions about things, or Remzo. Are they stupid, evil, or both? <laughs> we, we got we got to swing both because if you think that that is accurate, then you're stupid. If you're willing to enforce it in a way which is going to drastically impact the careers of others. Um, you know, who would otherwise be qualified to work there, then you're pretty much outright evil. There, there's no, there's no spin on this. This is, um, you know, this is no, this is like watching what happened with the New York Times about five years ago with the Barry Wise situation. This is what was happening with, um, with CNN when they had their big implosion, when they were like, you know, maybe we shouldn't go ahead and, you know, like blackmail teenagers who make, uh, you know, Trump versus CNN memes back in 2018. It's this incapability of admitting the truth. But what's crazy is like, I bet if we had like a Twitter gate situation, if we had like a Facebook gate situation, like right now we're saying they're as stupid as they are evil. I bet if we if we saw more emails, if we saw more of those correspondences, we'd realize, oh, no, this isn't by ignorance. This isn't by stupidity. This is by intent. They just absolutely hate us um, being in journalism, especially in D.C., is it, it, it's a it, it's like a union. It's like a union. The activist to journalist pipeline alone, people don't really understand that. It is incestuous and it never ends. And we can go on a whole tangent about, you know, the number of liberal journalists that go on free trips to like the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Not allowed to talk about that. They know exactly what they're doing when they go there and they know exactly what they're doing when they come back. These people. Yeah, like we'll, we'll call them stupid for now, but give it a few months and Elon Musk is going to be, you know, posting on X. You guys won't believe what I just found about NPR. <laughs> if you're just tuning into the Wake Up America show, good morning. <laughs> I'm Austin Peterson. That's. Remzo Martinez, he's managing editor at Amp America uh, magazine, which I also write for on a weekly basis. You should definitely check that out. Uh, we're talking to him a little bit about the blow up at NPR over Yuri Berliner coming out and doing some investigative journalism on his own outfit. Uh, if you en are enjoying this kind of content that you're hearing this morning, you want to hear more from us, make sure you do click that like button, but more importantly, the follow button over at rumble.com. We've got 730 people watching live. The numbers just continue to climb over at rumble. What's up rumblers real quick. I'm going to switch topics here, but I just want to remind everybody that the wake up America show did launch our own new community channel over at locals.com. Yes, we do. WakeUpAmericaShow.locals.com. Head on over to WakeUpAmericaShow.locals.com and sign up. You get a free membership for a month if you use the code LibertyLocal and drop some chats. I know you guys like to hang out whenever the show isn't live. So head on over to WakeUpAmericaShow.locals.com. Get a free month membership. Hang out with other people from the show. Make friends. Fight for liberty. And, you know, just generally goof off. Laugh at the left. Uh, Remzo Martinez joining us live now. Uh, Remzo libertarians is trending on twitter that's not usually a good thing uh it's usually a bad thing uh it's all it's almost Very always much. bad it's usually bad um they're fighting they're in fighting you're not a real libertarian i'm not a real libertarian he's not a real libertarian she's not a real libertarian they them zezers not a real libertarian okay so now that we've covered our bases of what mostly is causing it to trend um everybody is reacting to this hit piece over on mother jones which admittedly you didn't know about it just dropped last night haven't had time to read it but you and i know the libertarian party almost as much as anybody these days um fourth place potential this year i mean the the essentially the piece talks about the implosion of the libertarian party where in 2016 gary johnson gets three percent of the national vote like about four million votes now they're looking at coming in behind robert f kennedy jr 
he's likely to take third place. The LP has slid into irrelevance, although, you know, as a right libertarian, some argue that that's the way that the LP has gone closer towards maybe our ideological bent. But what, to what do you attribute the the sharp decline of the party from 2016 until today, Remzo, in your mind? It's ironic that you bring this up anyway, because I, I got a phone call from uh, the, the LNC about two weeks ago asking me to re-up my membership, which I haven't been a member of the Libertarian Party in probably uh, six, seven years. And I had to tell him, it's like, dude, like I, I vote Republican now. Sorry. And um, just the sound of disappointment on his voice. I could tell this man had been calling for a while. So I started reaching out to some other people. I'm like, hey, like, are you getting calls from them? Because I haven't gotten calls from them in a long time. And they're, they're calling. And when you look at membership, membership is 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 going down. Money is going down. It's just what we've seen for a while. And I mean, I, I should I will read this piece afterwards, but we can just ad lib this thing. Fill sure. in the blank here. What is the controversy of the day? How much money are they not making? Um, what is the problem with not being able to recruit enough candidates to run? I think in 2016, you had a record number of candidates running uh, up and down the ballot. That was helping bring a lot of attention to Gary Johnson and Bill Weld and vice versa. Over the last couple of years, you haven't even had that. Virginia was one of the biggest states in play in which libertarians were a giant factor going from 2013 through 2018. And the LPVA is almost non-existent. They haven't ran anybody statewide. So when you're not running people in what is still considered one of the biggest bellwether states, you know, still potentially maybe a battleground state, that's that's telling us something. So why, why do the left care about libertarians? Why do they care about third parties? Because it, it's the same reason why I'm hearing people hit on uh, ranked choice voting and Robert F. Kennedy. We got a radio host, cool guy named Dan O'Donnell here in Milwaukee. And he says, if you get Robert F. Kennedy on the ballot, he steals right wing votes that would have gone to Trump. If you get ranked choice voting on the ballot, you're going to steal votes for Republicans. And he makes good points for that. I agree with some. I don't agree with others. I look at the left, especially since Kennedy went ahead and announced, um, you know, Nicole Shanahan and his vice president. And I'm seeing the same thing. Robert F. Kennedy stealing votes from Biden. You would get ranked choice uh, voting on the ballot. We get third parties on there. They're stealing votes from Democrats. So, so the way I see it is it's never it, it's never more than what it is. They want us to go away. They want third parties and advocates of, of third parties to disappear, but they don't need to wish it too hard. You know, we've been doing it to ourselves for over like 60 plus years at this point. Mm. It, Americans just don't like to think that hard. They want to stamp one or the other three choices a bit much. It seems it's painful to watch because, you know, it was certainly you know, I've been in this game for a long time. You know, I ran for the Libertarian Party nomination, so I wanted the party to su succeed and I wanted it to do well. Part of it, you're right, is that the American people have turned a different way, gone into, in a different direction. It's about every 30 years or so that people tend to look for alternative options, and we were kind of in that cycle around 2016-ish. But then also there is the self-destructiveness and the self-destructive nature of the Libertarian Party. Any kind of outlying kind of fringe group is going to attract fringe people. Uh, and fringe people don't want fringe ideas or fringe groups to go mainstream because then, of course, they can't control it. Uh, and what you get is you get sort of like cockroaches or like dung beetles. They're all sort of fighting over their ball of dung, right? What have, the, what have we really created and what are we fighting over? Well, it's just a ball of dung. But for the dung beetle, it's beautiful. Right. They they want to they want to hold it. They want to roll up their ball of dung and they want to roll it up the hill and they want to sit on top of their ball of dung and they don't want anybody to come anywhere near the ball of dung. But the only people who are attracted to the ball of dung are other dung beetles. Nobody wants the ball of dung. Nobody's buying the ball of dung. Probably should have rolled up uh, something that was a little bit more valuable to everyone else. And that kind of is the problem. There's this there's a solipsism that exists right amongst our, our movement where it's like, you know, we only like what we like and what, what we want. And you as a marketer are not that type of person. Me as a marketer and as a salesperson, I'm not that type of person. Right. There's a reason why the Wake Up America show probably does better than the average libertarian podcast. And it has to do with the fact that as selfish as I might be, as neurotic as I might be, as egotistical as I might be, I take five minutes out of my day to think about think of other people. <laughs> I take you know five to 10 minutes and think, if I'm going to produce this piece of content, am I the only person in the world who likes this? Oh, yes. Okay, well, I might still produce it anyway and watch it get 200 views. 
or if I produce something that I know people like, I will be more successful. So I'm not, I realize I'm not the only person that exists in this universe. If my idea is to be an evangelical, to evangelize for these ideas, or to be a successful content producer, this marketing mindset that people like you have, right, we're not applying it to these ideas, because we seem to be willing to, you know, roll up a ball of dung and say, well, we're happy for it. And we'll fight off any other dung beetles for our ball of dung. Is that about accurate in your mind? That, that's about accurate. And I mean, um, who was the guy who ran for uh, president as a libertarian in 2004? Uh, uh, think... Not not Michael Badnerick, but it was, he was. No, Badnerick ran. Yeah, yeah Badnerick ran was, late. Yeah, no, it, was it was him. It was Michael Badnerick. Yes. Yeah. Like, let's look at what that guy did without the Internet. He showed up to the convention that year. Nobody knew him. Nobody was really competing. And he pulled a pretty sizable chunk comparatively, especially when you compare him to uh, Barr in 2008 and even Johnson 2012. Like, it has to do with this idea of, you know, wh why ultimately do people say that, you know, you cannot take this idea of when we see a certain number of libertarian votes, those are new libertarians. This was the Nicholas Sarwark argument when he was the LNC chair. It was this idea of my job is not necessarily to make new libertarians. My job is to get people voting for the libertarian candidates. Agree or disagree or not, I'm not a big fan of the man, but I think he made a good point with that. Why did we see so many people vote in 2016 for Gary Johnson and Bill Weld? It was not because they became libertarian. It's because they just hated Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. And I think that's the one thing that a lot of the ideological libertarians seem to not consider. It's there's a lot of factors going into convincing people that are completely divorced of you. Most people ne who will vote libertarian will never know any of the LP drama. They will never vote for another libertarian candidate. They are voting for that person because they are against somebody else. I think that's the biggest thing with Kennedy right now. People will vote for him, not because they like him, not because they agree with him, but because they don't like everybody else. And in a year that did not have a Kennedy, that leaves the question, though, would the LP continue to do well? I think or, or not as well. I think that is a question that we're probably not going to know because who would have thought that we would have again, Donald Trump on the ballot a third time against Joe Biden. I mean, this is a, the weirdest cycle. So I think a lot of things were leading in this direction of a, you know, a party that was just fading into irrelevance because of the party. I think just America at large, we have to admit a lot of things were also pushing it in that direction as well. So, you know, from a from, from a perspective of why do the two major parties work, here's the truth that I have had to accept myself. It's not about finding everyone who agrees with you. It's about finding people who agree about the things that you dislike the most and banding together for the 50 percent and arguing about the rest when you're in the seat. Completely agree, Remzo. And, you know, I feel like as a member of the Republican Party these days, that building coalitions for certain ideas amongst my local delegates. And uh, I've learned a great deal about what really moves people to get involved or active or motivated and to show up to their caucuses and to uh, some of it is actually just random chance, like you were sort of describing there. It's it's not so much that people really go and vote and, and take political action because they feel deeply about about a profound set of issues. It might just be because they're pissed off about what somebody did, you know, five years ago in, you know, a Broden Bridge project that made it harder for them to commute to work, right? So yeah. figuring out a way to, to capture those kinds of people might be a little bit more, more difficult, but we can build up coalitions of people who are actually active and motivated and, 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 want to work with, together with us on policy ideals. But uh, nevertheless, we, we should probably cover the Donald Trump story, uh, speaking as a Trump delegate, with this uh, this case in New York. I mean, they're trying to bankrupt him and embarrass him, but he's a man who cannot be bankrupted, at least uh, only can only be temporarily embarrassed in that fashion. Uh, and you can't really embarrass him when it comes to sex with porn stars. The guy appeared on the cover of Playboy magazine. I mean, I, I don't know who they think they're trying that the left, who, what they're, who they're really trying to appeal to with this case, Russia Gate was one thing, because there's still enough people who are triggered by Russia that they're they're like, oh, you know, uh, never Trumpers jumped on to the whole Russia conspiracy thing. But I mean, are they hoping evangelicals who are pretty much 100 percent behind him are going to suddenly be like, oh well, he had sex with a porn star. Oh, okay, well the guy that I voted for last time that was on the cover of Playboy, now I'm out. You know, like what is this about? 
Man, man, the Stormy Daniels hush money situation is just hilarious to watch because I, I think it was one of Trump's uh, one of Trump's legal aides went ahead and posted the letter that she went ahead and sent to this one tabloid basically saying, listen, like all this stuff was settled in 2018. I took the hush money and I have to say now that we never had an affair. It's like what, what like the person who was paid off doesn't even want anything to do with this. And, you know, creepy point born lawyer, I think, is in jail for trying to extort Nike a few years ago, too. So, I mean, look at the people who were involved in this. Look at the look at the president. Look at the precedent that had been established through this whole thing. Uh, when Trump says that he's going to walk away with, you know, nothing to pay other than the legal fees and everything else. He's 100 percent right, because he went ahead and made a statement uh, yesterday. And we all know that Trump makes grandiose statements. He's like all the legal pundits, all the legal commentators. They all say that Trump is innocent. I actually went ahead and fact check that. And he's right. Like, like he's going to walk out of this. What this is doing is this is meant to do exactly what you said. This is going to bankrupt him. But they're also just trying to see how much more they could break him. There's a reason why he brought up his son's graduation yesterday. He, there's a reason why, because he wants to point out to people the pettiness. If this were anybody else, like Hunter Biden still gets to go see his children. Hunter Biden is still under investigation for carrying an illegal firearm, for carrying uh, illegal substances on him, not to mention the fact that we can't talk about the cocaine in the White House. I mean, you want to talk about a man who can't be allowed to go to places. It should not be this dude. But they're doing it to Trump because they have to go ahead and break you financially. They have to go ahead and break you emotionally. And the, the man just doesn't flinch. I mean, with the porn star situation alone, the Stormy Daniels situation, I don't know a single person who looked at that and was like, nah, I can't do this anymore. If anything, I remember I was at a I was at a bar in Alexandria, a few of my buddies, and they, we were watching this at the time. And they would go ahead and show a photo of Stormy Daniels, and they were all just like, nice. And they moved on. They did not <laughs> care at all. They were, if anything, I think they were more committed. They're just like, you can't take him. He's fun. And um, it's just, you know, I, I'm just waiting. Like, what's the next thing after this? Like, uh, people have said, and even Kennedy has said this, like, you know, when when you start to really push up against these people, they're going to try and discredit you. First, they'll ignore you. Then they'll discredit you. Then they'll attack you. And then what's the fourth step? I'm not going to say the fourth step. But, like, when we look at the people we're dealing with, when we look at the people we're dealing with, let's not put anything past them of what they're not willing to do. Mm. Man, Ramzo, I think people over here in the chat loving what they're hearing, saying lots of nice things about you. Um, I've got to go and do another segment where I uh, talk about why we can't have beautiful women in society anymore, like why the uglification of women in video games. Um, so I'm going to go be really highly offensive after that, Ramzo, and I don't want to tar you with that brush. Ramzo, where can people follow you online, find out more of, about your work? Well, definitely go ahead and see all the great work from Austin and others at AmpAmerica.com. You can go ahead and argue with me on X at Hey Remzo. That's H-E-Y-R-E-M-S-O. And if you're a marketer, you know, and who needs some help, if you're a small business owner or even a candidate that needs to go ahead and get your uh, marketing up to speed for this general election cycle, go ahead and check out MarketerOnTheRun.com. And let's talk today. Remzo Martinez, MarketerOnTheRun.com and Amp America. He's the editor at large over there and a good friend and a friend of liberty. Thank you for your time today, Remzo. We appreciate you very much. Thank you, Austin. Take care. What do you guys think of Remzo Martinez? I, I eat very spicy. Ooh, delicious. If you enjoy the show today, make sure you click that like button. We'd love to hear from you today. If you want to send us a text, you can do so at 573-319-1586. Again, the text lines are open at 573 573- 319-1586. I'm going to take a real brief little commercial break. Um, not a commercial break, actually. I'm just going to play the bonus content for you again. Just need to catch my breath, get a little drink of water, go to the bathroom. I'll be right back. Enjoy the bonus content. I am going to go, you know, pee for liberty. And then when we get back, we're going to talk about the uglification of females in video games, the triumph of the mediocre woman on the Wake Up America show at wakeupamericashow.com. It's going to get spicy. Don't go away. Austin Peterson calls, you answer the light Fueling our show through day and night With every tea, every cool design You've unlocked the world supremely fine Coffee to stickers, merch in your hands Every dollar helps expand our plans Wake up America, feel the vibe 
Austin's here with the tribe. Your support's the key. You spark the flame. Thanks to you, we're up in the game. Is a lottery a tax? Yes, in fact, it is the holy grail in the art of taxation. A completely voluntary tax, and one that even George Washington made good use of to help build the roads. Lotteries provide public funds while being voluntarily contributed to by individuals through ticket purchases. It's a tax on people who are bad at math, says financial guru Dave Ramsey. Jean-Baptiste Colbert, Louis XIV's finance minister, once noted that effective taxation involves minimal complaint for maximum revenue, much like a lottery enticing people with hope while subtly extracting money. In 1990, Louisiana introduced a lottery, prompting Mississippi legislators to reconsider their stance despite a constitutional ban and ongoing issues with charitable bingo parlors. Louisiana's venture into casinos drawing funds from Mississippi residents eventually led Mississippi to enter the casino market as well, proving lucrative for the state. Decades have passed, yet the moral debates around state-sponsored gambling persist. Mississippi's financial struggles and infrastructure woes have softened opposition to a lottery, highlighted by the spectacle of residents playing out-of-state lotteries. Mississippi contemplates joining the multitude of states with lotteries, questioning the timing and potential financial benefits amid long-standing moral and economic considerations. Historical data from the first state lotteries dating back over 50 years offers insights into potential outcomes with recent analysis suggesting a lottery could significantly impact Mississippi's finances. Yet the opposition to expansion of the lottery harkens back to the old coalitions of Baptists and bootleggers. Progress is halted by two parties of differing worldviews united for a common cause, prohibition. House Speaker Philip Gunn's shift from opposition to neutrality on the lottery issue underscores the evolving debate with analysis indicating $1.83 to $94 million annual net tax gain for Mississippi. This net gain considers potential losses in sales tax revenue as money spent on lottery tickets diverts funds from taxable goods potentially affecting jobs and the state's GDP. The demographic most likely to play the lottery, often those with lower incomes, raises concerns about the ethical implications of targeting financially vulnerable populations. If only poor people play the lottery, then the lottery is considered a regressive tax. Is that a better way to fund government? Millennials' decreasing interest in lotteries, preferring other forms of entertainment and investment, suggests changing attitudes that could impact future lottery sales. If that's the case, then it might not be a viable option for the future. Casino tax revenue has seen its own cycle of growth and decline, reflecting broader trends in gambling preferences and competition. If more gambling is legalized, it may make it harder to fund government through such a system. Although if government is smaller, then that does make it an easier prospect. The public's demand for services without the appetite for overt taxation creates a dilemma for lawmakers who seek unobtrusive methods of funding akin to Colbert's taxation philosophy. It may be wise for us to have a nuanced debate around lotteries as a mix of hope, taxation, and public policy, inviting further discussion on their role in state finances. Welcome back to the Wake Up America show. I'm your host, Austin Peterson. Glad and thankful to have you here. Have you guys been enjoying the show so far? I feel it. Feeling a lot of love coming at me today. Do us a favor if you haven't already, click the like button and of course follow the channel. It's great to hear from all the new friends that we're making over at rumble.com. Like RAF6 joining us this morning. RAF6, first time having you here today. Glad to have you. Uh, I always appreciate whenever we see new names and faces over in the comments section. It's amazing. And we've got, looks like about 450 people joining us live over at x.com as well. So I don't want to ignore you guys. It's like a there's like a huge audience. You have 484 people <clears throat> over at x.com who are tuning in and listening to us live as well. So 800 over on Rumble, 400, 500 over at x.com. There's over a thousand people watching this show live, baby. I love it. I love it. I love it. We started the show, we had like 26 people when we first started watching it live. And that is scary because 
I left my job to podcast full time. And now I got a baby on the way and I'm still scared, but I have hope. I believe. You know, leap in the net will appear. Sometimes you got to take risks, big risks, big rewards, big IRS checks that you write to the U.S. Treasury. God, that was painful. They took it all, guys. They took everything I had. All right, it's time to talk about the title segment of the show today, the triumph of the mediocre women. Yes, we're going to talk about this. Ugly girls of video games. Have you noticed? If, if you're not a gamer, you have no idea. But uh, maybe you, if you watch TV or, or movies, you've noticed that they're putting more, and they're not always ugly, right? Maybe they would be what the kids call these days mid, right, in terms of middling, right, middling good looks, right? So this uh, gamer yesterday sparked an outrage over at x.com for a post that he made. As you can see, he's got 3.4 million views. Uh, all he did was this. He says, I couldn't resist. I had to fix this. Happy birthday, Aloy. Aloy is a character in a video game, Horizons, Shiver, Shiver. Don't play the game, but uh, do play some games. And here she is. Happy birthday to our beautiful Aloy. And here she is now. This is the PlayStation Australia sharing the post and the person underneath it did this they took the character on the left and they used a little bit of ai and they well they shall we say gave her a little bit of an upgrade <laughs> what's up cc23 from canada nice to have you here we appreciate you guys don't forget that we do have a new locals chat and uh i'm begging you head on over and sign up today wakeupamericashow.locals.com make sure that you guys um hit uh sign up using that code so you can get the membership that's free using code liberty local wakeupamericashow.locals.com sign up today and drop a chat over there after the show is over i'd love it if you guys would head over there and start to get to know each other i'd love to build a stronger community around the wake up america show we can do that at locals.com again free month Use code Liberty Local, not locals. Liberty Local. Uh, anyways, so yeah, so here's this guy. He takes a character and they upgrade it. I couldn't resist. I had to fix this. Happy birthday, Alloy, right? So probably the reason why they are so upset is one, because to the concept is to fix the character, which is, you know, kind of funny. <laughs> Uh, and then on the right, you can see the more beautiful character. Steffi, you look way more like the girl on the right than you do the girl on the left. I'm gonna be honest. I see my wife over there in the chat. Um, and before she was pregnant, this is what her, you know, this is what her body looked like. Um, but of course, this got people just completely outraged. And you can see uh, the comments from people. I love this right here. This is this the social shaming that goes on here. People who call Alloy ugly are genuinely tweaking. Like, have you never seen a woman? Did your mom leave you? Shame, shame, shame. Were you reproduced asexually? Shame, shame, shame. How are you calling her ugly? How dare you? How dare you, right? Because, because the left will sexualize everything but a beautiful woman. They cannot stand beautiful women is here's another example of this so somebody posted on april 9th this is the main character for star wars outlaws a new video game can't wait to not play it and watch it fail okay that's <laughs> i don't know if i would not play a game because they make the characters ugly but i would say that while this character is definitely more mid she's definitely on the lower range of the mid She's got tattoos on her boobs, which is always a really stupid idea. If you want to make yourself less attractive, do that. Some people do want to make themselves less attractive. A lot of women shave their heads. They hate men. They want to show that they hate men. So they either cut their hair really short like this, or they shave their heads, or they get tattoos on their chests as a way to signal toxic, stay away. Fine. That's fine. Not everybody deserves a partner. Not everybody wants to be a partner. Some people are lesbians. That's fine. All right. So this is the main character for Star Wars Outlaws. I would say ugly, but more likely to be mid. The tattoos for me make it ugly. And then the the stupid haircut with the ugly freaking bangs and, you know, the just general mid face. Okay. So there we go. So here's Valentine, very triggered. 
very triggered and engages in what females do. They they shame, shame, shame. A man finds something attractive or he doesn't find something attractive. Shame, shame. If a man finds someone attractive, you should be ashamed. If a man doesn't find something attractive, you should be ashamed. Shame, 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 shame. We live in a gynocracy. You must be shamed. Men should be shamed unless they dress as women. Now, if the person... um. It, here's the thing. You can't have big, beautiful boobs, right? You have to be flatter than a pancake like this character is right here. However, if Alloy had a dick and was a man, then it would be okay for them to have enormous tits. It would be, it would be okay. If that was a man with a penis, with testicles, fine, no problem. They the left would say, give the man with the dick and balls enormous tits, and it's perfectly fine. Am I right? Do not come. Do not come. I'm gonna come. I mean, is it like that really the creed of the left, what feminism has become today? Like it's all all leftist feminists are just one big Kamala Harris saying. Do not come. Do not come. I'm gonna and then come. I'm like, <laughs> am i right am i right here okay so why why do they do this why do they do this? why is it that the left wants to shame men for enjoying beautiful women well let's talk about it here here see we've got the front page of glamour uk i mean we're talking about glamour right glam being glamorous this is the front page or excuse me the cover of glamour what they're doing is and and this is ugly right this is objectively ugly okay this isn't like and i talked about this at the beginning of the show but it bears repeating this isn't like demi moore in the early 1990s appearing pregnant on uh let's see pregnant let's get that cover pregnant demi moore hope i don't get any weird porn or something pop up sorry guys pregnant demi moore magazine cover let's look at this this was a big controversy in the 1990s here it is vanity fair the front cover of Vanity Fair. Here we have, um, uh, we had a huge controversy in the 1990s. It was a big impact on the world. See, this article is even talking about August of 1991, Demi Moore naked and pregnant. And the reason why this was so controversial is because the debate was over whether or not a pregnant woman is beautiful. Now, I find my pregnant wife to be absolutely beautiful. She's gorgeous. She's luscious. She's sexy, and that has to do not necessarily with her body type, but I mean, like, she's just kind of like, I got lucky, I hit the lottery, my wife is, like, pregnant, and she's like, come here, Austin, she's very, you know, sexy. Uh, Demi Moore, beautiful woman. You can say, I think a lot of men could say objectively, yeah, she's beautiful, she's sexy, she, you know, she, she's, she's a very attractive woman. But here's the caveat. I know a lot of people out here are not going to like to hear this, Okay. Most men don't find most pregnant women to be attractive. I think there's a biological reason for that. We're programmed not to. We're programmed to stay away. Not for necessarily from our own wives, right? In which case they say that sex during pregnancy is perfectly fine, safe, even potentially a good thing, might actually uh, be healthy uh, for the pregnancy itself, at least from some of the stuff that Stephanie and I have read. But most of us, most men, I'm not going to find most other pregnant women uh, attractive. Even if she could even be like an eight or a nine. And if she's pregnant, I'm kind of like, you know, stay away, right? There's something biological in men. Now, women don't like that. And that's probably why back in these days, they're kind of like, look here, she's beautiful. Oh, don't pretend like we're not beautiful when we're pregnant, men. Shame, shame, shame. Look at our naked pregnant bodies. Demi Moore. And then, of course, they'll point to the ideal like Demi Moore and say, see, pregnant women are sexy. I and she's like smoking in a trailer and she's got tattoos on her boobs. And she's like, yeah, look at me. And she's, you know, she's got a glass of wine and her belly's out there with all the stretch marks. And she's like, that's me up there you see that's just like me right now let's get the little foot So there it is. So Demi Moore, right? So beautiful, pregnant, right? This was a way for women to say, see, we can be beautiful when we're pregnant. Okay, it's true, right? And most of us find our wives who are pregnant to be beautiful as well. There's probably something evolutionary to that. But I don't find other men's pregnant wives to be beautiful. I don't find other pregnant women to be beautiful. It's just not for me. Now, pregnant women, in that sense, sure. Demi Moore, she looks beautiful, right? She's pregnant. 
but she's a celebrity. You can't you can't take the the average. You can't take a, a ten and compare it to a mid. You can't. Stop deluding yourselves. Okay, this is about saying nice things to women to make them feel happy because otherwise they will shame, 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 shame. Boo! Shame, men. Shame, 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 shame. You have to feel guilty for following your biological urges as a man. You must find the woman on the left attractive. Shame, shame, shame. And if you find the woman on the right attractive, more attractive, then shame, shame, shame. Shame. How dare you? Right? Shame, shame, shame the men, shame the men. You must find the female who looks like a man with a gigantic, corpulent, uh, uh, porcine belly beautiful trans pregnant proud uh logan brown i'm sorry but you're disgusting i find you repellent one because you're a pregnant woman and so i'm biologically inclined to find you unattractive but also because you try and present yourself as a man and i don't find men attractive so it's double the ugliness here. Uh, I'm sorry, Logan Brown, I, if you found your happiness, you've made it to a magazine cover, you found some professional success with this, congratulations. But you're fucking ugly. You're disgusting. And I don't find you to be the type of person who should be on the cover of a magazine called Glamour. Right? Stop lying to us. And ladies... If you're out there and you're listening to this and it's making you angry that I say things like this, you're part of the problem, okay? Uh, you're the reason that you have so many problems, right? It's your problems are all caused by you in your own head. You have first world problems. This is a result of too much time on their hands and living in, a, this is what we get when we live in a, under a gynocracy. Okay, it started with the find me sexy. I'm a wine mom who smokes cigarette and I'm pregnant. Look at me. I'm like Demi Moore. It starts with this, right? Okay, she's beautiful, but she's pregnant. So it's not, you know, you need to find her attractive. Find her hot. I'm hot. I'm sexy. Look at me. Give me another Paul Mall. Ugh, Virginia Slims. Ugh. I'm sexy. I'm pregnant with my 12th kid and I don't know who the father is. I got 11 baby daddies and 12 kids. I'm sexy. Look at me. Blah. I can be on the cover of Vanity Fair like her. Blah. And that has led to this. That's where we've come. Okay. So let's continue uh, on this line of thought here. So why can't we have beautiful women? We can't have beautiful women because it's hard to be beautiful. It's difficult. It requires work. Being beautiful takes effort. It requires you to get off your fat ass onto the couch, men and women, right? It, it, you know, it, there's, you know, there's a trust, trust me, there's plenty of mediocre men out there. Ladies, you're just getting the hard time today. Plenty of mediocre men and of which all of society is de dedicated to destroying and tearing down every single day, right? So, so let's, today's just your day. Okay. So let's continue. Um, people like to be around attractive people, okay? No matter what walk of life you're in and what type of entertainment you consume, people like to be around attractive people. If you're a woman, you instinctively recognize this and you try to be beautiful, right? The real world bears this out, right? The, the luxury industry is a $532 billion industry. And, you know, as a woman, the undeniable truth is that your future has a lot to do with your looks. It does can deny that or you can be the i can smoke virginia slams and put bear claws on my boobs and think that i'm sexy and think your men are gonna want to wife me up i'm a catch i'm a 10 Ugh, virginia slams mm, wine Ugh, you know pink wine zinfandel from the gas station Ugh, i'm sexy attractive women earn more than mids Another reason that, uh, that mids do not want beautiful women around. Do not like that, especially because of what attractive women do to men. We pay attention to them. We want to be around them. Have you seen the women who work for Donald Trump? 
they are beautiful. Okay. It, Donald Trump is, while some of, I would say, Donald Trump's taste may be a little tacky and dated, if you look at like the gold, he uses a lot of gold in Trump, his suites in Trump Tower, which again, a lot of that stuff was built uh, in a different era. So, you know, it's just a little dated. But most of the women around Donald Trump, you will find, are absolutely beautiful. It is sort of a representation of that. And when you look at Joe Biden, for example, you look at the women surrounding Joe Joe Biden, they're mostly trolls and troglodytes and trans, right? They're they're not really women, they're biological men. And they are, they, I mean, is it too much to compare them to filth? Perhaps that might be a bit too far, but they look like they're a bit stanky. They look as if, well, what's the word? Swarthy might be the right word, swarthy. They're a bit swarthy because they want to give the diversity, equity, inclusion. They want to give a leg up to the mids and to the unattractives, to the to the mids and to the lows, the lows and the mids. They're, they're trying to diversify the looks department so they lift up applicants, right? And if it's a meritocracy, you know, it should be based on performance, but we all know it's not a meritocracy, right? The left is not about merit, right? So they're pointing at the ugly, diverse, swarthy woman and they're saying, hire that woman, she's a mid. They're looking at the ugly dude with the wrinkles on his face, wearing a wig, and they're like, hire that woman. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes. Um, uh, Pete DeCat says, all that voice training makes for a great smoker Marge voice. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> so let's continue on, right? So the infiltration of wokeness into the video game industry. So like for about the past 13 years, you might say the video game industry has been kind of under assault. Remember Gamergate, right? By This is ideologues, right? There was kind of a consumer revolt against wokeism in video games. There were a bunch of feminist grifters who tried to ply their trade, made a lot of money fleecing idiotic leftists. People like Anita Sarkeesian, Zoe Quinn, Brianna Wu, and others used the medium of video games to attack heterosexual men in order to launch their careers, right? And then the video game industry has been changed forever to reflect the sensibilities of the mentally ill, feminists, homosexuals, queers, wokesters, um, perverts. Just, it is what it is, right? And we're supposed to find this person attractive, right? They, they want heterosexual men to deny biological reality in order to push men like myself closer and closer towards androgyny. Thank you to Mighty Megatron for the donation. I appreciate that. He says, there it is. It's the DEI being pushed by BlackRock and Vanguard via ESG scoring and ratings money. Tell the folks about this. This is what drives companies to do the whole woke DEI stuff. Well, yes and no, um, uh, Mighty Megatron, you're correct, but it's not the full picture. Um, and that's something perhaps I can do in another show. I want to stick to video games here for just a moment, right? And so we're looking at, you know, why we cannot have beauty anymore. I love these videos. Uh, I was watching these by, uh, uh, gosh, what is the guy's name? He's the, the, uh, the quartering, uh, who started, this is where I got the idea for the show today, but they're trying to defeminize men. They're trying to defeminize women, right? They're making video game characters, mids or below. They're making them ugly because they want to destroy what men find beautiful and attractive because they hate us. Feminists, wokesters, leftists, communists. Uh, I won't say homosexuals, but, you know, the, the community, right? My brother is gay and he's not a member of all this kind of stuff. But they want us to find, you know, Marge here with the tattoos on her chest the main character of this game, Star Wars Alice, they want us to, they want, who are you gonna believe? Me or your lying eyes, they're saying. Your lying eyes. You find, she's pretty, she does, this, she's a 10. She's a 10. Yeah, yeah, smoking every day, yeah, yeah, I got a tattoo on my chest. Yeah, I can drink my pink Zinfandel from the truck stop. Ugh. I'm sexy. Look at me, I'm a 10. I don't think so. No, right, not a 10. 
But this character, Alloy, she's kind of like the poster child, we say, of uglification, right? So the Italian Vanity Fair, the Italian version of Vanity Fair, actually felt like this was so important and triumphant. They actually featured this video game character on the front cover of their magazine. Let me push this up for you here. Here we are. So this is the front cover of Vanity Fair. Now they use this actress, Hannah Hoekstra, as the model, right? And I love this, this is very funny. It's hard to believe that they turned a moderately pretty woman into a bull dyke lesbian. Moderately pretty, that's funny. But yes, this is the model that they used. And this is the woman, okay? Jesus, it looks like me. I mean, look at her beautiful jawline here. And then over here, absolutely beautiful, right? And then compared to this, I'm sorry, beautiful, ugly, right? And of course she's gay, right? I love that South Park episode, put a woman in it and make it gay. <laughs> Uh, everything. It has to be gay. It has to be ugly. It has to be gay. It has to be trans. It has to be anything but what uh, heterosexual men might find attractive. It can't be. Um, it can't be anything that straight men love attractive. Hate video games. Play male fantasy. Here's a clip that a lot of people love to riff on. Video <laughs> games. Here. This is. This is your average leftist gamer take here. I, I wrote a blog post a while ago about why I fucking hate video games, because this is what it does. It appeals like the male fantasy. Here it is. I, I wrote a blog post a while ago about why I fucking hate video games, because this is what it does. It appeals like the male fantasy. I hate video games um, because it appeals to the male fantasy. Now, I love OnlyFans. I love OnlyFans because... <laughs> That empowers women. They hate video games because it appeals to the male fantasy. They love only fans because it empowers women. Do you notice, I don't know, a little bit of hypocrisy, one to the other, one to the other? It's okay to do, it's okay to demean yourself. It's okay to demean your body. It's okay to go out on front on OnlyFans. It's okay to to show yourself off to thousands and millions of men, most of them being married men. What's not okay is to make a beautiful woman in a video game, right? If she's got a, you know, a beautiful round derriere uh, and has got tight leather pants. Remember when Lara Croft Tomb Raider was hot? Remember when you used to turn on video games and it was Duke Nukem and he would go up and he would give the stripper money, right? He'd be like, shake that ass, right? Remember the good old days of video games? Well, it's not like that anymore. Now they want to make the women ugly in the video games because they hate men. They hate us. That's that's what you should, that's the takeaway from that video. She says, I hate video games because it appeals to the male fantasy. And anything that appeals to the male fantasy has to be destroyed and deleted because they hate us. They hate men people like you and me, they hate women like you who appreciate men who appreciate beautiful women. They have to destroy beauty because with beauty comes truth, justice, and the American way. Uh, no. Well, yes, to an extent, right? Um, wow. 1,013 people watching us live over on rumble.com. That's amazing. Thank you. I appreciate you. I would like to tell you something right now. I am a five day a week streamer, okay? This show streams live five days a week, Monday through Friday, seven to 9 a.m. Central. I got 1,008 people joining us live over on Rumble. I've got 530 people watching us live over at x.com, 1,500 people. Good God, man, what is happening? We're building an army. I've got two things that I need your help with before we go today, okay? One is this. I'd like you to do this. Wakeupamericashow.locals.com, okay? You're gonna take the code LibertyLocal, 
And you're gonna enter it in when you sign up. And it's gonna give you a free month subscription, okay? Wake up America Show dot locals.com so that is going to be the first thing that you help me with and i want you guys to participate don't just sign up and then never go there spend a little time in interact drop a comment you know drop a like head on over there let's start to build a real community around this show the future of the wake up america show is going to be successful based on people like yourself building a community and rallying around it let's do it let's do it today wake up america show dot locals.com okay the second thing that I need your help with, I know it's a lot to ask. You usually should only ask for one thing, but I'm asking for two today. I'm a little bit greedy, a little bit selfish. I work very hard to produce the show. Second thing I'm gonna ask, just visit the Griff shop on your way out, okay? Now, I know that the best thing for me would be for you to buy some products or some merch, but just get an idea for what we have over in the shop. As you exit the show, exit we call it the Griff shop, exit through the Griff shop, it's ap4libertyshop.com. That's AP, the number four, AP for Liberty shop.com exit through the Griff shop. Just take a look at some of the things that you see there, throw some things in the cart and then head to the checkout and be like, Oh, that's actually, that's pretty reasonable because I don't have to pay for shipping because shipping is free in the United States. Like everything should be free in the United States. What am I saying? It's a free country. Damn it. Check out my beautiful new glass cutting board. The Calvin Coolidge stained glass cutting board is available exclusively at apforlibertyshop.com, yeah. Beautiful, check this out. Stained glass, Calvin Coolidge stained glass cutting board. Your next charcuterie party, right there, you can get it. I made that myself, yes. So head on over to apforlibertyshop.com, enjoy it. We'll see you guys tomorrow. And I, you know how I know I'm gonna see you tomorrow? Because you've already clicked follow over on the feed. Meaning you're gonna be back here tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., right, right? Enjoy. We'll see you guys tomorrow on the show at wakeupamericashow.com. Bye, guys. Expanse of time, a year might seem like a mere moment, but oh, what a year it's been. In September 2022, Austin and Stephanie Peterson embarked on a journey, a journey to wake up America. They began humbly, with just 20 souls tuning in, learning, listening, and though challenges arose, like the looming shadow of YouTube demonetization, their spirit never waned. And now, thanks to you, thousands rise with the sun to join them, to listen, to engage, to be a part of a community. So here's to you and to wake up America. For memories shared, for friends made, for the journey ahead, and for never, ever forgetting to rise and freedom. Happy anniversary. I'm Donald Trump and I approve this message. Believe me, Austin Peterson is the best. He's got the greatest Wake Up America show I've ever seen. Whenever I tune in in the mornings and watch the live stream, let me tell you, he has got the absolute best content. I love his guests. It's just a total blast to watch. And I highly endorse and recommend the Wake Up America show. It's terrific. Believe me. Is the outdoor your home about as exciting as a library? Then spice it up and unbore your space with our custom metal signs. Crafted with love and a bit of libertarian magic, you can customize your own metal sign at ap4libertyshop.com. So head to ap4libertyshop.com, customize your own metal sign today. to a world of vocal discovery at Peterson Voice Studio. I'm Justin Peterson, here to guide your musical journey. Envision a place where your voice reaches new heights, where every note tells a story. We embrace all singers, from the enthusiastic shower vocalists to aspiring stars. 
ensuring each voice finds its unique rhythm and tone. Are you ready to elevate your voice? Visit petersonvoicestudio.com and sign up for remote lessons tailored just for you. Let's begin this melodious journey together. Tired of spending your hard-earned money on woke corporations that don't share your pro-freedom values? Fed up with sipping liberal lattes and progressive cappuccinos? Introducing Founding Flavors from AP for Liberty Shop. Get your day started with Washington's revolutionary roast. As robust and principled as the man himself, this blend is the shot of energy heard round the world. Or maybe you want to taste the fervor of freedom with Adams's patriotic perk. It's as dynamic and balanced as the U.S. Constitution, sure to awaken your spirit of liberty. For the aficionados, we've got the Jeffersonian Java, a complex mix of flavors that speaks volumes about your refined tastes. And don't forget Betsy's Liberty Lullaby, our decaf option, crafted with the same care and dedication Betsy Ross put into our Star Spangled Banner. This blend lets you enjoy the taste of freedom anytime without losing sleep. No woke beans here, folks. Just pure, patriotic, Patriotic, pro-freedom flavors brewed with love for liberty. So why compromise your principles for a cup of coffee? Stand up for your values, perk up your patriotism, and start your day the American way. Get your founding flavors at apforlibertyshop.com.